there really could be no one better equipped to help chart the path forward for us than our guest tonight. Professor Nomi Hazan served as member of the Knesset for three terms, from 1992 to 2003, on behalf of the Merits Party. She served as Deputy Speaker of the Knesset and a member of numerous committees, including Foreign Affairs and Defence, Education, Economics, Immigration and Absorption, and the Committee for the Advancement of the Status of Women and Gender Equality. Nomi Hazan was one of the founders of the Israel Women's Network and has been, an active, has been active in a variety of feminist, human rights, and peace organizations. She currently serves on the board of Fulbright Israel and of several leading civil society organizations. Please join me in welcoming Professor Nomi Hazan. Moderating our conversation will be Hugh Rivington. Hugh is a multi-award winning journalist whose reporting work has taken him many times around the world and to almost every corner of Australia. He has been a foreign correspondent and presenter for CNN and Channel 9 and a political editor and newsreader for Channel 10, where he still works. He is the author of Minefield, A Life in the News Game, published in October 2017. Please give it up for Hugh Rivington. Michael, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this is wonderful to have her here. Give her a big round of applause. Now, we're going to have a, a fairly wide-ranging discussion about this, the state of the project in Israel at the moment and uh, you know, the prospects for the future, the, the battles that are currently underway. We want to encourage your questions a little later on, so there will be an opportunity to ask questions uh, in the name of the normal housekeeping. Please keep it to a question. Uh, you know, if there's, if there's an extended uh, life history, uh, then I'll probably cut you short and try and bring you to a question um, that's just should that arise. But uh, let's get to our guest. No, it's so wonderful to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here, and Erev Tov, Shalom, and uh, thanks for having me back in Australia. It's been some time. We're not going to talk about Australia tonight, or at least not much. You might surprise, be surprised to know. Can you give us a sense? I'm going to get down into the details of a whole bunch of individual is issues. But in terms of your level of anxiety or positivity about Israel, through the long, many years you have of ha having lived personally the project of Israel, how would you rate your current level of satisfaction and comfort about where Israel is? <laughs> I have to ask the audience, what would you do with this kind of question in my position? Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll answer, it, it, it'll take me two minutes, but bear with me. Um, Israel has the most right-wing government today in its entire history, literally. And for somebody like myself, the most right-wing government raises my anxiety level so high that my doctor said, why is your blood pressure just rocketing? Uh, seriously, on the one hand. On the other hand, um, it's unclear where things are going, and I get immense satisfaction. I smile every Saturday night for the past 20 weeks when I see hundreds of thousands of pro-democracy Israelis from all sectors and walks of life standing there and saying, we want a different Israel than the one that's being proposed. So. Uh, I can calm down a little bit every once in a while, but it all relates to the fact that as an Israeli, I believe we're living in the most uncertain times since the creation of the state of, men, of Israel. Everything is fluid. The external environment is fluid. And there are immense dangers, 
and immense opportunity. The economy is fluid, and there are immense dangers and immense opportunities. And the question is how we navigate through this uncertainty. I think uncertainty is absolutely essential to dynamic improvement, but it's up to us to do it. So I know it's a complicated answer to a simple question, but we're living uh, in complicated times. Let's go, if you like, to the trigger for most of those demonstrations was the attempt at so-called judicial reform that have now been put on something of a back burner since uh, last month. What do you think Netanyahu and those around him were seeking to achieve beyond the, you know, the technicalities of what they were trying to do about the selection of judges and the powers of judges? What do you believe was the underlying uh, purpose for that effort? Um, everybody's asking that question, but I'll give you my take on it. I just want to comment for a minute. I'm not sure that the reform is on a reform in brackets is on a back burner. I think it's changing form and shape, but we'll get to that. I'm sure because you're going to pounce on me, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully, I'm not going to let you be so quiet and, 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 and polite. Uh, um, this government came to power with a very clear set of objectives. The, num the first objective was to consolidate its power as much as possible. In other words, to use the democratic means of election to achieve some objectives which are not necessarily democratic. That's number one. And number two, to promote their real goal, which is to maintain Israeli dominance, and Israeli dominance, primarily Jewish dominance, over the entire area from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River. And these are ideological and political goals that have been very clear from the outset. But this new government also had a very clear strategy at the beginning, and you picked up on it in your question, and that strategy was, number one, to move this agenda along as quickly as possible. More, all the time pressing a series of changes. And number two, to bring out a broad range of changes at the same time. The judicial changes are the ones that people focused on. And they focused on it on these changes because the government has attempted through legislation to undercut the independence of the judiciary, which in Israel is the only major check and balance on the abuse of power by the government because the government by definition in a parliamentary democracy has a majority in parliament. In other words, to control all three branches of government, controlling all three branches of government, and really this is extremely troublesome, means essentially moving from a democracy, even a flawed democracy, to an authoritarian system. So that's um, 
It was a major initial push, but behind it, if one reads the coalition agreements of this government, you will see that there are 150 promises of legislative changes on almost every single issue that touches on the lives of Israelis. Um, for example, as a woman, there are several initiatives to approve discrimination on the basis of gender in public spaces. We've never had that in Israel. Legislation against the LGBTQ, again, several measures that are almost hair-raising today. There are on the books not five or 10, but maybe 20 or 30 various pieces, bills, proposals, etc., that relate to the diminished place of Arab citizens of Israel in the country. I can continue on and on and on. So this goes in lots of different directions. And that was built up and was a cause of the pushback, okay? But I want to be very clear. This is not an attempt to deal only with the judiciary. This is a regime change in the full sense of the term. And that's why people, I think, were so upset. We'll get to that in a minute. But if I may, I, I, I just want to help everybody, because it helps me as well, understand what I'm talking about. There are actually three major elements of what's going on, and I don't think we can begin to understand the scope of what's taking place in Israel in less than five months, if we don't understand all three elements. One part of the current crisis is a vertical crisis. It's a crisis of a Loss of confidence and trust by many citizens in government, in any kind of government. Um, I've become popular in Israel recently, which for me is very edifying, by the way, <laughs> after many years of being somewhat controversial, because um, people say, Oh, we miss you. And I say, how can you miss me? You didn't like me when I was around. <laughs> and and, and they, they, they say to me, well, we, we miss you because you're not a politician anymore. You're, okay. There's really distaste, and that's a vertical axis. And by the way, when there's lack of confidence in government, then citizens look for other outlets, but it also means it's almost impossible to rule because there's less likely to accept what you're trying to get across. The second axis is, axis is horizontal, and it involves all, and it's really a social crisis. It's not a political crisis. Israel is a deeply divided country. It's divided politically, it's divided socially, it's divided ethnically, it's divided religiously. Families are divided today. And that creates a lot of friction and tension, and one has to deal with it. This second axis has very deep roots. It's a result of the fact that things have not been resolved up to, up to now. And there's a third crisis, and that is trying to understand what the framework of activity is. Our politics within Israel proper 
Do they extend beyond into the occupied territories? Are, is the social crisis just about Israel? Again, what are the boundaries? We're talking about political and social crisis in very amorphous boundaries, and that's the third problem. Put it all together, who, you know, relax, it's going to get better as the evening progresses. <laughs> you said you're encouraged by the people who protest. How resilient do you think that protest movement is, given the uh, determination of the forces that are uh, trying to drive the judicial changes and all the changes that lie underneath it. How resilient is it? First of all, why are people out in the streets? Uh, can you imagine um, at least 10% of the Australian population being out in the streets every week? I mean, that's an enormous amount. But some people like me, I'm getting old. I've had enough demonstrations in my life. Okay? I follow everything that's going on. I sometimes fuel it a little. I still have that capacity. And um, I ask people, why are you going out? Well, What's behind this? And um, most people from the beginning said, we are struggling for the heart and soul of this country. The changes that are being proposed are not anything that we can subscribe to. We were brought up on the values of Israel's Declaration of Independence, of equality and justice and freedom and peace, okay, which we never fully implemented, but we believe strongly in this is, this is our foundation. How can we accept discrimination and homophobia and yes, fascism and racism as part of the government policy? It's not us. We're fighting for our country. That, that's the, the binding element. But when you dig down deeper, Different people are fighting for different things. Some people came out uh, because they're Democrats and they understand all the complexities of judicial reform and judicial change. And they say this will ruin the entire system. Some people came out because they um, they're worried about the side effects and the economic effects of what's going on. So many people are worried that their kids or their grandchildren will not find in Israel that they want to live in. So the motives vary and are sometimes very specific. That, that gave immense power to, to to the uh, protest, to the extent that now that I, I'll just give you the facts and figures so we can get, get through them. Um, two thirds of Israelis do not support the changes proposed by the government on the judicial issue. And this is consistent for months to the latest polls that were published on Friday. Over 50% are sympathetic and part of the pro-democracy camp that's developed. Every single poll 
shows that if the elections were held tomorrow, the parties representing the protest movement would gain a clear majority. Okay, but whether they'd be able to form a government is a totally different question. And I can go on. Um, this is powerful. It's the first time I've seen, and I've been around for a long time, in my lifetime, such a public outpouring with a clear goal to make Israel better, to make Israel into a country that is livable, that is decent to all the citizens, and that we can be proud of. So, so on that basis then, is the situation that Israel is in now a temporary blip that will be corrected by the natural balancing act that is democracy? Uh, so even if Netanyahu and those around him were to get this judicial reform thing through the system, that that would be simply undone at the next election. Is, is this just a short period of difficulty that will be resolved, no. or is it more profound? No, because all the, again, all of, all of these problems have rules. We wouldn't be in this situation if we had resolved previously the relationship between religion and state in Israel. But we didn't, we always sidestepped. This wouldn't have come to a head if we had uh, resolved the major asymmetry between Ashkenazi and Sephardi or Mizrahi Jews, as we call Jews from Arab speaking, and there is an asymmetry. The OECD just published today or yesterday that Israel, that the income inequality in Israel is the highest in OECD countries. One third of the population of, is, is living near or below the poverty line. And that includes 40% of children in the country. We wouldn't be in this position if we had dealt with this, these economic issues differently. And we definitely wouldn't be in this situation if we dealt differently with the Palestinian-Israeli issue. So if I may, can I, can we argue a bit? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, you know as well as I do, you've covered major events in the world scene that if a reform like this goes through, you can't negate it the next time around. This is too big. It changes the structure of government and how we're working. And you have what, what's needed now is to address a series of problems simultaneously. It, it's much more profound and difficult than one imagines. Uh, I, I am very concerned that the government, as I said, its policy is changing, its strategy is changing form. I described it the, the other day in a different way. The initial push was everything at the same time. Now, they're going back to much more intriguing strategy of Salami. We can do this change and this change and this change and this change and this change, and tomorrow it's going to be um, a bill that opposes Palestinian flags in Israeli academic institutions, and the next day it's going to be uh, allowing women to be separated in public venues 
if it offends somebody for religious reason, and you, when you chip away the salam, boom, 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 the cumulative effect is the same as if you push everything through, but it's going to be done differently. And I think the protest, it's hard to sustain this kind of protest, but um, the protest is going to change form as the strategy of the government is changing form, so, uh, but it can't be reversed. It's got to change. And if Israel is going to change, it needs an alternative. It can't go back to what it was, because what it was was flawed. If it goes in the direction that's being suggested by those in power today, it's a country that many of its citizens can agree with basic issues. So does it fall apart, potentially, on the collision between those who value a liberal democratic ideal and those who most often, I guess, through religious or some other nationalistic reasoning, uh, have a call to something other than liberal democracy? They see a different sort of set of certitudes. Look, the alternatives to democracy are clear, and they're not what mo many people uh, believe. Uh, uh, liberal democracies have two alternatives. One are authoritarian governments. One, that's one alternative. And the second alternative is chaos. And some people claim that in a typical way, Israel is both getting increasingly authoritarian and increasingly chaotic. And, but that's the strength of liberal democracy as well. But liberal democracy, you have to create a climate where people feel that they can live with a situation that they're not angry or, or feel neglected or capable of doing things in order to promote very clear interests. And um, that's the challenge. But uh, that's also the beauty of democracy. You can find that balance. I want to ask you and move on to the question of Israel's relationship with the Palestinian uh, territories, the Palestinian people. But just before I do, on the question you mentioned earlier, you say that you don't believe that the judicial reforms, so-called, are on the back burner, that they're simply reforming. Um, what does that tell you about the level of utter determination? that in the face of the polling that you mentioned, in the face of the hundreds of thousands of people out on the streets, most political operators look at that and say, um, it's not a fight worth fighting, it's not a fight we can win. But that doesn't appear to be the way in which it's being read within the corridors of, of the government yeah. and the coalition. That's, you know, that's a really good question and something that's come up a lot recently. Why pursue this if it's creating such a backlash? But, but there are answers to that question. Uh, some people try to get into uh, Bibi Netanyahu's head and to see why it doesn't make sense. <laughs> That's essentially what you're saying. But there are three answers to that. And I'm not, I really puzzled. I, I, I haven't figured out whether you should take them all together or separate them. But one answer is um, if the Prime Minister did not go along with his own Minister of Justice, who is from the Likud and pushing that, and the chair of the Knesset Committee on Justice and Con Law and Justice in the Constitution, who is from his key partner to the right, Bitsa Smotrich of Religious Nationalists, 
who are pushing for it, he won't have a government. Okay, he's got a, a, a right-wing government, but it's very split. And by the way, uh, easily most of the Likud and MK members of Knesset support these moves. So one reason not to try and wiggle out of the judicial reform is if he does so, he won't be able to maintain his coalition. It's a political reason. Uh, He's a hostage. To a certain extent, unless he finds another partner, but he can't find another partner because at this point, frankly, nobody wants to join him. Uh, even past allies don't want to join him. So that's problem number one. That's one way of looking at it. Second way of looking at it is look at the, look. Mr. Netanyahu is under indictment on corruption and uh, embezzlement and breach of trust, and he's in this long drawn out uh, uh, trial. And the only way he can evade being pushed out of politics entirely is staying a prime minister. If he were a minister, the law doesn't allow a minister under indictment to serve as a minister. But nobody ever thought that a prime minister would be under indictment, so the law forgot to mention prime ministers. And he's there, he's in office. So he's got a very strong personal motive which compounds the political issue that I discussed for first reason. I, I was never totally happy with these explanations, so I had a third, and that is, why does one assume that this agenda is not part of his ideological agenda? And if it is, that will explain continuation, again, it will be in a salami technique, but um, much more easy to understand. So I give it to you to choose. And, and a quick question again before I go to the Palestinian question. Joe Biden has uh, reportedly told Netanyahu that he's not welcome in the US until he, he pulls the judicial reform notion. Uh, does does Joe Biden does he have influence in this game? And if the U.S. president still does have influence in this game, how important is next year's election? Who? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Let's start from ground zero, and that was not a pun. Um, let, let's start from the beginning. The United States is Israel's most important strategic ally and asset, period. And any major change in U.S. policy towards Israel is going to affect Israel's stability and security. And everybody understands that right, left, center, etc. And, and Netanyahu has a lot of U.S. mileage behind him as well. Um, Biden is very concerned about the reforms. I don't use the term reform. It, the easiest term is that this is a, a judicial coup, but I'm beginning to think again that this is a re regime of people that is being initiated by the government. He's issued warnings. He's made it very clear because he understands, and not only Biden, but I think most of the leaders of the democratic world understand that relations with Israel 
have two layers. The one layer is a layer of interest. And U.S. interests and Israeli interests in the region and globally for many, many years have been um, very close. Let's put it that way. But the second layer is that there is a common value base. Okay. And if you look very carefully at Biden's policy now, he's beginning to distinguish between U.S. Israel, Israeli interests and the value foundation. I'll give you just one example, if I made it, to press up on this point. Uh, I think Michael mentioned at the beginning, in the opening, this bill to tax, uh, slap a 65% tax on donations of foreign governments to, uh, to NGOs, mostly civil society, organizations that deal with human rights and with liberal issues. And um, Biden came out two days ago and said, this is unacceptable to the United States. Now the EU came out, France, Germany, Belgium, a whole series of European countries. But the important one was that Biden said, no. This is not what we expect democratic countries to do. And it's very concerning. You even listen to my accent. I was born and brought up in Israel. And look what comes out of my mouth when I speak English. Really. Uh, it, 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 you would say it's a poor American education, but I think I had a pretty good one at the time. Um, it's difficult. It's difficult, but also let's remember that the United States is going through a crisis because it's not a unipolar world anymore, and there's a reconfiguration going on in the multipolar system, and it's I'm not sure Biden is necessarily navigating that as well as one would expect. Would, would having, Trump do better? Having said that, the person who initiated all of this was Trump, as we know well. And um, when Trump was in office, there was next to no data between him and Netanyahu. Did that serve as Israel? Did that serve Israel's long-term interests? I doubt it very much. And there, by the way, behind your question was something that I wanted to ask you. You're, I know, it's a very Jewish thing. <laughs> um, but your, the assumption behind your question was, that it would be Trump as the Republican candidate. I could run down a short list of alternatives, but uh, he certainly seems to be leading the polls. You know, and the alternative is DeSantis at the moment. Yes, of course. It would. What were you about to say? <laughs> Trump with fewer indictments, it seems to me. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> let's, uh, let's go to the Palestinian question because um, there are fears that a third intifada is imminent if it hasn't already begun. What, what's your assessment of um, tensions as they currently exist and the prospects for the coming months? Mm -hmm. And how many minutes do I have? <laughs> well, I, I need a few. Um, and in many respects, what's going on in Israel is being reflected on the Palestinian side and vice versa. Um, the 
Palestine is imploding today. Uh, the Palestinian Authority has next to no power. Vying factions, a great deal of unrest, economic misery, and, and, and no clear horizon of how to get out of the daily humiliation of Israeli occupation and overrule, which has been affecting the lives of every single individual Palestinian for years. You have very extremist factions, you have people, the, the educated youth is leaving the area, etc. So you have a process of implosion. In case you wondered, from a very sort of long-term uh, perspective, what we've been discussing now about the crisis of, within Israel is also a crisis of implosion because the not only the rules of the game are untangling, but much more importantly, the cement, the solidarity that kept people together it is also faltering. It's, it's split, splitting apart. So you have implosion in Israel, implosion in Palestine, and under these circumstances, the relationship between the two becomes much more explosive. And um, is is a two-state solution still conceivable? I, I was sort of in the middle of a sentence, but uh, but I that's. Don't apologize. I was for the question. I'll bank it. Go on. I, I won't bank it. I'll address it. Um, I, I don't think we would be in this situation if we had gone further to um, explore the possibilities and initiate and, and imagine a different relationship and implement that relationship in the past. Part of the reason we haven't been able to do that is that there are people in Israel that believe that we have the rights to the entire land and they intend to realize these rights at the expense of Palestinians. And part of the problem is that we also always have very good, very good, and I mean that, excuses. There are attacks, there are external threats, there's a Iran, and Iran is a threat, okay? And <clears throat> we, we, we say, well, we can't deal with that now because we have to protect ourselves. Delaying dealing with a crucial issue of Israeli independence, which, by the way, how can you be totally free when you dominate another people? That is, that that really ties you in knots, and and therefore, Israeli freedom depends to a large extent on Palestinian freedom, and Palestinian freedom depends also on Israeli capacity in an asymmetrical situation to do something. I, I had to go there before answering your question. I, <clears throat> I was in Australia, uh, you may not know this, several times in the past, talking about a straight two-state solution. And many of, in the audience found it really difficult 10, 15 years ago. 
to even uh, hear the term. It was hard. Today, I would say, well, say two-state solution. I wish we could do it, okay? <coughs> I think it's very difficult to implement the classic two-state solution because where do you put the boundary? There's 700,000 settlers across the Green Line. Uh, population, the Arab population of Israel today is close to 2 million. <clears throat> Nobody's going anywhere. And if we really want to resolve this, and I think it's absolutely the existential question, for Israel, <coughs> and by the way, for the Palestinians as well, we're going to have to think not only in terms of boundaries, but also in terms of people, and also in terms of citizenship. And that means we have to think of a two-state solution in different terms than in the past. Not a divorce, <clears throat> but how to share the land while maintaining, excuse me for one minute, <coughs> while maintaining the identity, culture, history, religion, of each community. <coughs> and today, <coughs> and for some time, there are a lot of fascinating initiatives that are talking about federal and confederal solutions to state-based, but with a lot of sharing. And that's a new paradigm. It's a livable one. <laughs> if we go that way, there's a lot of hope. The suggestion that's been put forward, of course, as you're aware, in fact, it was in the pages of The Guardian in the last couple of days from uh, Mustafa Baghouti from the Palestinian National um, Initiative of just go straight to a one-state solution. <coughs> put a circle around the whole thing or a board around the whole thing and then try to find some equality of citizenship within it. Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard that. Practical difficulties immediately come to mind. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, let's talk about the practical difficulties. There's so much suspicion built up by animosity and a one-state solution is predicated on trust. It's not going to happen. Because you don't know how to get from here to there. What we're talking about and what I suggested now is taking the basis of what exists, understanding pragmatically that you're going to have to share some electricity and some water. And in a period of climate change, you need to share the air, okay? And you start with that and you build up. And that's why you need a formula which is an open two-state, a revised two-state, an updated two-state, but the principle is based on the understanding, and I will repeat this time and again, if we don't learn to share the land, then nobody will be able to live on the land. And understanding that gives us pragmatic possibilities which don't jump from here to there in, in a matter of you know months or years, it's not going to happen. It requires a level of trust which is so fragile and so easily broken and there are actors in there who would very happily break it. Sure. 
I can think of a few. If you want names, I'll give them. I'm sure there are all kinds of agencies who have all kinds of names. Um, so many difficulties there that you map out, both internally within the Israeli project, but also with the Palestinians. Uh, there's a capital flight of sorts happening out of Israel at the moment. I'm not quite sure what the human capital flight is at the moment, whether that is, is tracking on the same terms. You've written about this. What is your fear and what is your assessment of how people are moving their money and themselves in response to what's going on? There's a major capital flight. Israelis are moving their money in Israeli companies are even moving their headquarters because they're afraid of the instability of the economy under present circumstances. Um, many are moving themselves, or at least contemplating it. And um, they're moving themselves because they're not able to see how their children, and again the grandchildren, for older people, have a horizon to live safely and again decently in Israel in the long term. And for many people, that, that, that's terrifying. But I, can I take you one step forward for a moment? That's a sign of despair. And I have to say this very straightforwardly. Despair is not an agenda. It's not a guide to action. It's basically saying, oi, and throwing your hands up in the air and saying, how can I personally escape? But it's not going to solve anything, okay? Um, I, I also sometimes wonder whether hope isn't a similar kind of sentiment, that it's not an agenda. Hope is not an agenda. An agenda is a strategy and a belief in human agency and our ability to change things. So, if we went back to the beginning of our discussion, look, there are great dangers in period of, self, uh, of uncertainty, but there are immense opportunity. Are we going to allow the dangers to overcome us? Or are we going to grasp the opportunity, which doesn't come very often in human history? I've been waiting for this day for 75 years. I'm a little older than 75, in case you were wondering. Okay. And because how, how, Often do you have the chance to make a difference and to build something that can last for the next generation. So let's take it, take the opportunity. And therefore, yes, I watch the capital flows. I watch the people getting a second passport. I have mapped the lines for renewing an Israeli passport. People want that security that they've got that escape route. Okay, but I what I really want uh, is that everybody who cares about Israel commits to taking it that one step forward that will make us all much happier. Let's give people an opportunity to put some questions to you. Sure. On the floor. Um, I'm not quite sure what the mechanism is, but I think there is a microphone here. And uh, if you want to put up your hand. Thank you. 
Oh, finally I can see you. <laughs> Hi, Amy. Um, I have a question about them. You hear the protesters out in the street calling out names like Abby Dikta from Likud or Yuli Edelstein, and you kind of expect that you know, the decent people in Likud would have responded, would have brought down this government, and it hasn't happened. I mean, obviously, with, with Gallant and, and the sacking of the, the uh, defense minister, it, it almost seemed to be happening. But what's going on there within Likud? And, you know, within, especially, you mentioned before, that the polls showing, you know, huge um, support for the democracy movement. Why isn't there a groundswell coming out, and what will it take for them to come out and bring down the government? Oh, uh, the, uh, there are two answers to that, if I may. Thanks for the question. Um, look, m many of the key figures in the Likud that many of you know are no longer in the Likud. The Likud they left the Likud because the, the liberal branch of the Likud <clears throat> and they were either pushed out or removed themselves. I'm talking about people as different as Benny Begin and Dan Merido and Michael Eitan, for those of you who know his names. Okay, they're not there. And the Moli Knat, who served in me, with me in the Knesset, she was on um, many issues a real rival, especially on the question of Israel-Palestine. But we together did a lot of the legislation on, the, on, on women's rights, okay? She is one of the most vocal critics of this government. She's not, she's, she grew up in an included home, but she's not part, so, Part of the people that you're talking about aren't there anymore. And those names that you mentioned, like Yuli uh, Edelstein uh, and Avi uh, Dichter, etc. You know, you ask why they're so quiet. And can I put my politician's hat on? Sometimes it comes on. <laughs> Try to keep it off lately. Um, look, they see themselves as successors to Netanyahu. And they can't go too far bucking the line without pushing themselves out as well. So they're very cautious because what they're doing is biding their time and hoping that. Um, there will be a succession struggle in the Likud, and they want to be part of the, they want to win. What would it take? Uh, <coughs> Thanks, Naomi. Um, I had a lot of questions, you kept answering them, um, so thank you for that. Just to go to the end, um, you talked about the strategy. We see a lot of headlines, what's happening every single day, and people are involved in what happens every day, but who's working <coughs> on this pulse, on, on the kind of the biggest strategy about where the country can be and what it can look like, and how can people in Dashboard assist in that? I, the reason I, I signed is, you know, we all read the history books and we've all studied and we know the details and stuff like that. But I recognize, I think you all do, that we're in the midst of the process. And when you're in the middle of the process, it's so difficult to grasp it and to guide it in, in various forms. It's, it, it, it's a problem. So, um, I'm going to use a term that I sometimes use with my children and they don't like it. And by the way, my children are lo no longer 10 years old. Uh, and the term I would use is patience. 
we, we need to have patience because these are longer term processes. And our job today is to redefine, I'm not even sure how much it's redefined, it's revise and update the vision. And in a sense that's being done by lots of people all the time, some intellectuals, and really fascinating stuff is coming out now in Israel on the revise and update, okay? It's being done in the streets. I think the New Israel Fund does that on a regular basis just by thinking of its grant. It's being done by the same tanks. I spend a good portion of my time now in meetings and discussions exactly of that sort. Has it yet congealed into a charter? Not yet. Patience. But that leads me directly into your second question. Your second question is, hey, what can we do? And my answer here, and I, I always tread carefully because in case you haven't noticed, we have a few problems at home in Israel, and so we're not the people to give advice to anybody else, really. But in case you haven't noticed, uh, this is, how did I, how can I put it? 95% of Jews today live in a free society. And being, living in a free society is an integral part of their Jewish identity. Not just human identity, of their Jewish identity. And when Israel goes in directions that are anathema to what they believe is the essential part of who they are and what they fight for, then it can create an immense breach between Israel and, and world Jewry. And therefore, what's going on in Israel is an inherent part of, I think, also being a Jew outside of Israel, because in many respects, Israel always centered Jews outside of Israel, and therefore we have to be better so that you can feel better, or otherwise, older generation is going to continue believing the middle generation is going to be much more skeptical, and the third generation are going to say, oh, this is just too much trouble. And that's not what you want. So in many respects, we're in this together. And if we're in this together, what to do? There's one key powerful tool, I believe, that we have and that is what I'm using now, speak up. Don't be silent. Whatever, however you speak up, you're helping Israel become better because that's what it's all about. Um, as Israel has no constitution, it seems possible that in 10 years we'll see this pattern replicating. Do you think there's any chance that a constitutional bill of rights might ever be passed in the Knesset? And if there isn't, what do you think <coughs> prevents these exact, exact same arguments happening with a slightly different Likud or a slightly different party in 10 or 15 years when people have forgotten? A great, great question, but I have to say that um, to the best of my knowledge, Great Britain doesn't have a constitution even uh, either, and it's doing that badly. 
okay? Uh, Israel does not have a constitution, it doesn't have a second house, it doesn't have a federal structure, it doesn't have these built-in guardrails that provide the checks and balances. Can Israel have a constitution now? I, I, in the Knesset, I was part of several efforts. By the way, if you ever want the material, it's in it's together with my washing machines in the storage room. Um, we tried everything at the time. And I should have known better, because as a political scientist, I know that you can't have constitutions unless you have a social pact. And we don't have a social pact. So you, you can't force it. And the attempt to, 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 to write the preamble to the constitution uh, two, three years ago with the passing of what's known as the Nation State Bill, uh, Bill which pronounced that Israel was the homeland and the state only of the Jewish people, didn't do much to promote constitutional liberties of any sort. As a matter of fact, it's a key bone of contention to this very day. <coughs> So if you ask me, no, we don't have a social pact. Without the social pact, we can't begin. And we tried the Bill of Rights. And we have a partial Bill of Rights. It's just lacking a few elements, like freedom of speech, <laughs> uh, freedom of protest. Should I continue? <laughs> uh, it doesn't even have the term equality in it, which Israel's Declaration of Independence does. I believe that it might be possible, it might be possible to begin to construct the Bill of Rights. It will take some time. I am not looking for legalistic solutions now. I'm looking for understanding. When there is understanding, lawyers, in case you didn't know, can do anything. <laughs> and therefore, if we build up the understanding, we'll be able to legislate it in very good ways. But it's a really great question. More women, more women speak up. <laughs> I just don't know me. Um, my name is Fadi, and that caused me um, to be discriminated against just as I came in tonight. So it's ironic that we come to an event where we are promoting equality, freedom, and democracy, but I get treated differently because I'm not a Jew. My story is an Israeli. Um, from memory, you were an advocate of post Zionism, and I remember an interview with you on Israeli news that you actually said that you were ahead of your time on this on this issue. Um, how do you see that in current Israel, considering that Zionism is, has been exploited a lot by Ben Gvir and small church to get their, um, their way? And where did the left in Israel and merit in particular go wrong? Hello, Fadi. You use so many labels that I'm looking around to see where they are in my connection. I would never have categorized myself as a post-Zionist, okay? And I don't know, I, we've succeeded in having a whole evening without using the term. I'm extremely Israeli. It's in my heart and soul and being and body. And I'm an Israeli that believes very much that um, citizenship requires equality for all in the state of Israel, 
regardless of religion and nationality and origin and language and the history. For me, states have citizens. And you cannot differentiate between citizens. If you do, do so, it is inhuman and self-defeating. And that's where I stood. have stood and tried to stand my entire public life and in my belief system as well. I have seen the situation deteriorate. I find it an abomination. And I will continue to fight for an Israel that treats all its citizens equally and makes them feel a part of Israel. So that's the short answer to your question. I'm sorry I left 